This work has sort of been about 12 months in development. The title of the work is Islands of Incarceration and it really follows on from um, my interest in islands and I think perhaps that's why David was interested in my practice. So I flew over here from Perth about 12 months ago and selected this site. I was quite lucky because very few artists had selected sites yet so I kind of got the pick of the bunch. Unfortunately this building had never been used before so we needed to kind of convince the Harbour Trust that they really need to build a new staircase and we needed to put in this, this railing as well to make it safe for everyone to go up there. I was interested in this site for a number of reasons. I really enjoyed the kind of the inside outside experience of the space that it wasn't going to be work that was locked away that you would have trouble finding. I liked the air th flow through it and it also linked in with the conceptual ideas that I was dealing with um, and the site that you see that's printed onto this fabric which is the Ludlow Chewett Forest in Western Australia. I remember as a child driving through this place in the back of my folks car and just thinking how amazingly beautiful it was but also thinking get me the hell out of here this is a really uneasy space and if you know my practice you know that I'm interested in dealing with these issues of landscape and trauma and history and memory and, and how um, unmarked landscapes can generate these sort of sense of unease. So in the last few years I've been looking at massacre sites around Western Australia and uh, as it sort of, as I was kind of researching, it somehow didn't surprise me to find that there had been a massacre here, which we refer to as the Wannarup Massacre in the 1840s. And it really made sense, my earlier memory of this place. Um, so over the last 12 months I've been down documenting uh, this site every two months, every change of Indigenous season to I guess get a sense of this landscape. What you're seeing here printed on this this fabric is a panoramic view of this of this site and it's kind of one of those black fella white fella histories you know it's uh, one of those histories that's not very well documented. I've spent a long time traipsing through the state records offices and the local police records trying to ascertain what really happen here. You know, when you look at kind of massacre histories in Australia that, you know, the, the significant ones are like the Black Line in Tasmania and in, in Western Australia there's the Pinjarra massacre and they were kind of government officiated ones so they're really well documented and there's a lot of information about them but of course in a place like the Ludlow Forest which is three hours drive nowadays from the capital city, the documentation and the histories are really sketchy. In, in 1841, there was the main landowner in that area was a chap named George Lehman, and he had sort of uh, captured, I guess, uh, a 13-year-old girl who he was using for domestic help on his homestead. And the senior Wardandi Noongar elder came to him and said, you know, I want our girl back, and an argument ensued, and, and George Lehman was speared in the leg, and he died of his injuries two days later. And over five years, the Wardani Noongar people, in retaliation to this, were more or less decimated. And, uh, and every couple of years, there's some development, there's some logging, there's, um, there's salt mining in this area, and, and, and remains are uncovered every now and again. Um, but that's as much evidence as we have. And I think there's about eight to ten remains that have been found in this area. But oral history tells us that up to depending on who you speak to, between three and six hundred people were massacred over this time. So I'm really interested as a white Australian about this landscape that I occupy and trying to reconcile my own experience with the landscape that I'm on. I mean I've worked closely with the Wardandi Noongar people in this area to talk about this and I, I don't ever want to suppose that I could possibly speak for their experience or talk about their spirituality so I'm also a little bit conscious of not kind of appropriating their culture or their kind of spiritual experience of this landscape. Um, this is very much my experience of this landscape as a white person. I certainly was aware of the, the, uh, the nature of this work and the veiling of it and that you could stand within it and look out to Sydney Harbour, the first site of contact, and connect that and that that view of the massacre site would mediate your view of this place. But the reason why I use this image was you'll see the death lilies 
and I, so I like the death lilies. And it's also springtime, and, and there is something kind of perhaps optimistic about that, about a rebirth. And I feel that um, perhaps if we talk about these stories, that, they're, that that is somehow optimistic, despite the fact that they're so sombre and horrific. Um, and certainly David Elliott talks about that relationship between beauty and horror and how when you put those two things together you create unease. And I think I wanted the forest to be beautiful. I'm really interested in my work making people feel something um, rather than it being a kind of a didactic experience, something that they could have almost read or something that they view at afar or at arm's length which is why it's important for me that people stand within the work, that they become part of that story. I've been looking at landscape for many, many years and the older I get and the more, I guess, connected I get to my own sense of place, the more these issues become really important. And this is probably the first work that ultimately and significantly and singularly addresses these issues. So I don't know whether you noticed when you were up in the space the sound that you can hear. Um, I collaborate with an artist called Cat Hope and she is an amazing woman who's really interested in the relationship between low frequency sound and its capacity to affect people I guess. Um, and so the, the very subtle sound that you can hear in this work is uh, the sound of the soundscape from the forest where the low frequency sound has been pulled out and run through a subwoofer. And, and what I hope to achieve by using sound in this way is to kind of set a context for the way that my work is read and uh, not to be didactic about the history of this place but to I guess remind people in a way of that uneasy feeling that I remember feeling when I was a child. And I think that this site is really helpful in invoking that because of its history and its relationship to logging practice and the kind of, you know, the development of the colony and those sorts of things. Um, it just kind of made sense, particularly walking on the slatted floor and feeling a little bit unsure of your step. Uh, and I also really like the, the, the relationship between the movement of the fabric and I guess the movement of stories and of histories and of ideas and how they shift and move. Well, you know, I, I went through art school in the kind of postmodern era, you know, where we were taught to be um, nervous of any ideology and to the point where it was really hard almost to kind of take a position on anything. And it took me a long time to recover from art school in that sense. And I think that kind of the politics of art and looking for kind of deep and meaningful relationships with the culture in which we occupy, you know, is, is kind of, I think younger artists need to think about that more, you know, and I, because I do think about art practice as a visual philosophy, you know, as, as a way to kind of connect meaning and to reflect back on the culture in which we occupy and, um, and avoiding fashion and the relationship between art and fashion kind of sometimes horrifies me. <laughs> but anyway, I could go on about that for a long time.